Hello everyone, I'm Dani and welcome to our podcast. Today, Break.com talks with David Liss, who works as a vice president at the Frontier Center for Public Policy. If you haven't heard about it, the FCPP is an independent Canadian public policy think tank. And if you're new here, remember to subscribe, huh? Hi, David. Welcome to our podcast. Well, great to be here, Danielle. Nice to see you. Oh, you too. Uh, well, let's begin with a simple clarification here, just so our listeners can get on the same page. What exactly is a think tank? A think tank is um, historically, and there's been a number of them through the years around the world that really try to focus on creating better public policy to meet certain objectives, whether it's to serve people better. Um, and that's what we do. We're really about better ideas to create a better future for our country and our citizens. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. And uh, how exactly does the FCPP work on that? What we do is we carefully, um, well, it really comes out of a, a deep passion and care and concern for our country, for our fellow citizens. So we're really about trying to take different policy areas across the board, whether it's healthcare or transportation or economic policy or education, uh, to name just a few, uh, the environment, and saying, how do we formulate really good public policy that actually serves people well, that's transparent, that's accountable? Um, in, the, in, the, in the public sector, there's a lot of great things that we do, but unfortunately, there's also a lot of, in many ways, warped public policy, uh, policy that's, that's um, really isn't about serving people. It's about serving special interests. It's not helping uh, the people we're going to serve. And so we try to work very carefully at looking at facts and analytics within um, really important principles of what we think is good public policy. And I think there's many key policies um, that, that illustrate good principles that a lot of people have no clue of. So I think it's, it's such, an, such an important point because the sentence of, a lot of people have no clue of, no, mm -hmm. are not aware of. I personally feel that myself, even though we are in different countries. I feel like uh, public policies is like this sort of mystery for most people. We vote yeah. and we don't well, keep track and, on that. And that's a really good point, Danielle, is that we want public policy to be um, aware um, across the Canadian public. In fact, worldwide, we want people to be very thoughtful and have incisive debate and discussion about what makes for good public policy. And I just want to give you a couple of principles that we try to follow. So as an example, we really believe that it's important to empower. And I know these are a lot of buzzwords that you hear, but um, it's important to empower citizens to make I mean, you're the best person to make that decision, not some faraway government. So one of the principles we would say is subsidiary in, in the sense that you want to make um, government services at the level that is closest to the community. Um, and so you want to structure government um, where local government is extremely important. You want to devolve those kinds of, of decisions as close to the people as possible. And we think that's good public policy. The other one that we would say is there are certain markers within the size of government within an economy that is very important to keep in mind. And I think a lot of countries have forgotten that. If, you, if the government is way too big, um, it, your economy devolves over time. Your standard of living goes down um, because your productivity is often really, really low in government. Not always, but you have to say, how do we make government high performing? Um, so it's efficient and effective, and it really serves the people instead of just kind of special interests or um, short-term political thinking. And um, we think that's that's wrong. It's it's atrocious the the amount of bad public policy um, in Canada, uh, let alone around the world. And and if we don't keep these things in mind, we do great harm to our fellow citizens and our future, let alone the next generation. Absolutely. And uh, again, it's, it's a crucial thing, especially in this case that 
you guys are not just a, a database, right? You are offering also critical thinking on that's right. those subjects, yeah. right? Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, insight. We're we're trying to bring critical thinking to the current challenges our country faces and learning from them. Um, like it's amazing when you think of it, how many in our current systems of government, how many people are not aware of what makes for good public policy or have taken the time under the pressures of kind of political day-to-day stress and, and action to really objectively look and reflect on these things. Now there's bits and pieces of that kind of long-term thinking and analysis that happens in many segments, like for example, in the, in the bureaucracy, uh, to some degree that happens, but you'd be, you'd be shocked how often that is politicized. Um, you know, there's story after story where, you know, um, there's, there's some really good people say in the bureaucracy that do careful reports reflecting on the data of an issue, but the political masters don't want to share that information, that truth, if you will, publicly. And that's wrong. We think, you know, and there's always healthy debate. And so that's one of the principles we want to encourage as well. So we think it's really important to keep in mind also lessons from other countries, whether it's in Brazil, whether it's in New Zealand, there's a host of really good things that we can learn from, but unless we bring them into the public debate, often that won't happen. And we're independent now, that's a very important thing. As a think tank, we are independent. A lot of think tanks are not independent. They're either funded by government. So what kind of opinions do you think they may come up with, often in favor of the, you know, the political party of the day? So how is that going to be helpful? So in our case, we're not funded by government. We don't accept it on principle. Uh, we've been approached many times by government saying, hey, would you accept this you know, million dollars or something like that? We don't accept that. We want our um, advice and recommendations on public policy to have integrity. That's very important to us. And and, uh, there's always judgment around that, but uh, we're funded by by donations and thousands of people give generously to us and say, hey, we really like the work that you're doing. And uh, that allows us to do things. So we don't really have any fear. Often a lot of organizations have fear and that's really sad when you think of it. We should be able to value discussions where we have respectful but honest discussion. And that's a very important culture. And in fact, it's foundational to the success of any nation, really. Absolutely. And I again, I think you touched another very important point, that is this independency, because quite often these policies, they, they end up ruling about... Um, crucial points and sometimes they have such a, a, a myriad of opinions about them. Let's say, for instance, something that it's really, uh, we are, have been talking about it finally, <laughs> there is a uh, uh, race, right? We have this uh, problems with uh, people being treated differently and sometimes we do not address that. And we're not only talking about uh, Black people problems, let's put it that way. Uh, but we're also talking about indigenous people as well, mm-hmm. because there is this white sort of uh, uh, supremacy that still takes the lead. And it's not easy to talk about those issues if we you have some sort of strains with companies and with governments, right? Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that uh, those kinds of examples about race as an example. We We would say that, first of all, there's a really big picture here. One is culture, we would say, is upstream or frames what kind of policy is possible in a country. So culture means kind of the behaviors, the way we treat each other, um, the way of thinking. And part of culture is really referred to as kind of the ideologies of the day that people believe that frames a reality. And so in Canada, we would have a tradition of, I know it's sometimes confusing these terms, but we have a kind of a liberal democratic tradition. So we would believe, for example, that it's critical to respect the rule of law, to have due process. We don't just simply lock people up. 
We have a due process where people are judged on evidence and facts, not public opinion. And we judge people content of their character, not by their race. And so those are, and I mean, I could talk about that for quite some time. That's a tradition that goes back about a thousand years within Western countries, particularly England. That's really a lot of our traditions come from. Mm -hmm. And we think that's been a brilliant tradition. And it's one that we shouldn't take for granted, but it's something that is not necessarily in line with other countries. Um, they don't have those traditions. So we don't take that lightly. So freedom of speech, um, you know, those rights and freedoms of the individual are critical. And so as much as we believe that racism happens, it also needs to be framed up by facts and, and information that enables everybody to succeed. And we want to be in a a colorblind society and largely Canada is one like that, but it's not perfect as any society is. So in our case, um, we try to bring insight to culture as well, because it does have a big impact on, on policy. That's great to hear. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, moving on a little bit to talk about some of the challenges you face since we are in this topic of how hard things can be. Yeah. Uh, What are the challenges that you usually face when trying to, to cover some stories? Well, you know, it's, um, that's a great question. Uh, the challenges are really multiple fold, but I want to just give you one example. And I want to share with you in the form of a concept. And that is, um, we often refer to, in fact, a sister thinker, think tank, pardon me, came up with this concept. And you may have heard of it. It's called the Overton Window. And the Overton window is a kind of a frame of reference, um, like a window, a boundary, where within a certain culture, there are parties that work hard to either expand the window, the room by which we can talk about issues, or they try to narrow it. And this can be very harmful to society to narrow the window on a lot of issues. So I'll just give you an example in Canada, We have a healthcare system that is um, really quite interesting. It's largely a public monopoly that is very low performing. We have very, very long wait lists. And Canadians are often kind of proud of this healthcare system. There's a lot of wonderful people in it, but it's very poorly designed. In fact, it's so poorly designed that within the OECD countries, there's about 32 of them, Canada's healthcare system consistently ranks at the bottom end. And yet, when it comes to the amount of money that we spend on healthcare systems, we're the second most expensive in the world. So we have the, the worst of all worlds <laughs> in Canada. We have a healthcare system that is super expensive, a lot of money, and it's very low performing. And there's many measurements of a system like that. And we have an index where we examine that very objectively whether it's wait times or um, all kinds of, of measurements. Well, that's a system that really is begging to be reformed. And yet the Overton window in Canada is so narrow that you can barely talk about it without someone saying, oh my, how dare you question about our healthcare system? You're not Canadian. So there's a set of interests behind that that want to manipulate people to say, no, we shouldn't be learning from other countries, whether it's like Germany or France that pay a, uh, a much lower amount of money, but objectively had a, have a much higher performing system. So we need to have a culture that enables people to talk about issues in a very creative way so that, you know, when, when somebody attacks you personally, I mean, that's one of the the foremost, um, what are referred to as logical fallacies, you attack the person, you don't discuss the real issue at stake. So that's an example. That's a challenge where the narrow, the stage, if you will, the window for debate is narrowed. And sometimes we have to break through that. Thank you for sharing that. Because uh, honestly, this is something that I wouldn't think about. I, I, I wouldn't go to, to that line of thought. I mean, Daniel, I think the other point it's worthwhile saying, and I, I hesitate to sound so gloomy because I'm, I'm, I'm really not. Um, our many countries in our world are in deep trouble. Um, and 
uh, I'll give Canada as an example. We have almost a perfect storm and it's really a reflection of, we would refer to as really quite incompetent public policy um, and also a culture that is degrading. And what I mean by that is that, let's take, take an example. We are spending such huge deficits and our response to COVID-19 was quite dysfunctional. I mean, by any objective measure. Um, and I can go through that in great detail. We've done all kinds of reports and people are welcome to look obviously at our website and you know, sign up, subscribe to our free newsletter. But the point is that we have very large deficits and debts. And when you start borrowing that kind of money, um, you start, um, you, 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 you distort your society. You become really dependent on government expenditures. You undermine the culture. Like we paid so many people not to even work. I think as Western countries, we spent more money than anyone else. It's quite, quite astounding during COVID-19. And we have really, um, a, not an incisive vision to both grow our economy but enable people to work and perform at a higher level. And that's um, been critical to the foundation of our standard of living. Canada has one of the higher standards of living in, in, in the world, but we are truly at a precipice where we uh, risk losing all of that. And it's because of bad public policy and ultimately bad leadership. And it's really kind of tragic. Now, the good news is that we can change it around. Um, and that has happened before. Um, there's many good examples where if you'd look at England after uh, World War II, um, England was in a very difficult uh, situation, uh, it was heading on a, a deep path of, of uh, socialism. Its economy was deteriorating in terms of basic productivity and standard of living. Um, it, was, it was a pretty, pretty grim time. And there was a, um, a, actually a sister tank that was founded there and became the genesis for turning the UK around. Um, and I know there's always healthy debate about what will happen, but there's no doubt that um, England really prospered and came into its own and renewed itself in terms of its way of thinking. And that made all the difference in terms of people's future. Wow. I, I'm loving this talk because uh, you're making me reflect on so many things. <laughs> and I could, like, could actually keep it going because... Well, yeah, we, we were discussing here during our, our breaks, right? <laughs> that uh, public policies are sometimes an issue, right? Not truly a solution because people don't yeah. understand what's going on. Well, and, and that's so true. If you don't understand what's going on and really look at the factual information, I'll just give you one example. In Canada, there's a movement for, quote, alternative energy. And um, we're one of a handful, if not like really one of the few in the country that dare to ask, is this really green energy? Like when you build windmills, how do you build the windmills? Well, you use enormous inputs from fossil fuels and, and other things. The wind um, is, doesn't like, it's not going all the time. So your energy is not necessarily affordable or reliable or dependable. I mean, so Who's really promoting green energy? Well, we've done all kinds of analysis that shows how that in quote green industry, including Greta Thunberg, I don't know if you remember her lecturing us, those are the people funding her. So you have to kind of realize, are we doing good public policy or who's really benefiting from what? So you have to This is not an easy business because you can't be afraid. You have to dare to look at that facts because ultimately we have to ask ourselves, how do we create a clean environment? That is very important. And one in Canada, and I, and I'm, I don't know entirely the situation in Brazil, but the largest, produ the largest polluters in Canada are, believe it or not, municipalities who dump raw sewage in some cases into the ocean. Um, and it is just hypocritical. It's appalling um, that you have uh, that level of government. There's many of them that treat their waste in a very careful, responsible way, but there's a series of other ones. And I'll just give you one example, not too far from me on the beautiful area of British Columbia on Vancouver Island 
is a is a city of of several hundred thousand people called called Victoria, and Victoria actually puts its raw sewage in the ocean, and yet there's people who are fighting quote for the environment when it's right beneath your nose. So we need to do things that are, dare I say, smart to pursue green policies. And often that is doing the basics well, like cleaning your sewage. How more basic can you get than that? That would make it a huge impact. So I think what we have here is, um, again, the importance of, of getting at facts and being honest with saying, hey, how do we really create a clean environment as one example of many? And my last question for you today, David, is uh, you said that you are funded by donations. So what is the best way to help you keep uh, this work going? Well, you know, we um, certainly welcome donations. There's um, uh, sections within our website that people can make an online donation. Um, sometimes we talk with different actors who have an interest in kind of trying to make a larger project succeed and There's people like that too, but yeah, donations are very important. That's pretty cool. And uh, you can check the website on the info text information we will attach to this podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, David. I'd love to talk to you today. It was a pleasure to meet you, Danielle, and all the very best to you and all your listeners. Thank you. <laughs> and listeners, thank you as well. And if you enjoyed this episode, please press subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast app because that will show the algorithms that this is an important conversation and so more people can learn about the importance of the FCPP. Thank you again and see you at the next episode. Bye.